Hello and welcome. Today you are uh, joining the session called Implementation of High Resolution Endoscopy or HRA for anal cancer screening for people with HIV at federally qualified health centers, also known as FQHC. FQHCs. My name is Dana Morrison and I am the Senior Director of AATC Programs at the Oregon Primary Care Association. And today I'm joined by my colleagues, J.D. Armstrong and Rena Appenzeller. Um, we all have worked on this project in various different ways. Um, and so I just wanna highlight kind of the AETC role, but really a lot of this work falls to JD as um, the provider champion who really took this forward. My job is to kind of oversee all AIDS education and training center programs in the state of Oregon and in Southwest Washington. And Raina Appenzeller really was instrumental in this project as the practice transformation coach for the project and as the senior manager for practice transformation at the Oregon Primary Care Association. JD, is there anything you want to say to introduce yourself at this time? Um, sure. Yeah. So I'm JD Armstrong. I'm a family medicine doctor, um, but I'm also an HIV specialist. Um, and so I do a lot of uh, primary care and HIV treatment for my patients. Um, and so anal cancer screening is something, as you'll see during our presentation, that became very important to me and something I worked hard at trying to implement at my own clinic. Awesome. Thank you. And I'm going to get us started. So just uh, to get through some of the background, we did receive funding from the Health Resources and Service Administration under Ryan White Part F, or the AETCs, to support this work, really to build um, a pilot for how to integrate HRA into the Federally Qualified Health Center for the treatment of folks with HIV. Um, all of us have nothing to disclose and no commercial interests. But I do think it's really important that we take time before we launch into this presentation to really acknowledge all of the folks um, that really have supported us in this work to get to where we are today. Um, HRA is not like other training topics that the AETC um, really covers. And it, it, for example, if you're doing a talk on PrEP, it's a clinical talk, you can give the information, you can have the guidelines, someone can leave the next day and potentially start prescribing. HRA requires much more of an investment um, to really build provider and health system capacity to support HRA. Um, and it really took a lot of folks um, helping JD along this process, as well as our team to really understand the nuances um, of this work. And so we just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge all the folks, and I'm sure there's folks that aren't on here that should be on here, um, that really have laid the foundation for this work. Today, we're really going to focus on why implementation of HRA should be upscaled in federally qualified health centers, um, and how this really is a way to address unmet need um, in certain jurisdictions. We also really wanna describe the training approach and the educational resources that were used for implementation of HRA, um, and explain some of those key steps uh, in order to help support other folks in replicating this process. Um, I think a lot of this work in HRA started long before the anchor study. HRA is not a new, um, concept. It's something that we've been screening for anal cancer, but I do think that it has had a history where folks didn't know if there was a, a benefit um, over kind of the, the thought of maybe causing uh, worsening outcomes for folks. And so the anchor study really was a pivotal study um, in looking at, uh, looking at a prospective cohort of what the outcomes were for providing HRA or not for people with HIV. And I think part of the reason this is so important to our patient population is really just acknowledging that one in 10 men who have sex with men who are HIV positive will develop anal cancer throughout the course of their lifetime without any intervention. And so I think this study was really pivotal in saying, hey, um, we need to actually make sure that we're providing this as standard of care. And it was actually stopped early because there was so much um, improved health outcomes amongst folks who were receiving HRA in the treatment arm. Um, I think the, the other thing about the anchor study is just really uh, making sure that we bring attention to um, the study came out, uh, guidelines are forthcoming, um, really to make sure that this is the new standard of care. But we really started this work kind of before that happened um, in, in anticipation of what these guidelines might be. And one piece of the anchor study that I think um, left us to really think about how we would do this well is there was this caveat, these results may not be generalizable to settings in which HRA and treatment are performed by clinicians with less training and support. That wasn't quantified in the anchor study, but it was a piece to say, okay, so how do we define what is needed in order for a provider to be competent? JD, do you wanna add kind of how the anchor study really impacted your work as a clinician? 
Yeah. Um, I think that uh, I was, you know, uh, inspired by the anchor study to really put more efforts into um, bringing anal cancer, an anal cancer screening program to my patients um, because I was seeing the benefit um, in research. Um, and, uh, and it has also been kind of a benefit to me personally as just a, a kind of like exciting new thing that I could offer patients. Um, I think it's helpful. I think primary care can be a challenging field to work in sometimes and having a little variety um, in what you do is exciting um, and having a little expertise in kind of like a niche area um, can improve kind of uh, satisfaction at work as well. Awesome. So just for folks in the room that may not be familiar with HRA, HRA is the visualization of the anus and perianus through a colposcope, excuse me, using acetic acid and Lugol solution. The purpose is to identify precancerous lesions that may require treatment to prevent anal cancer. HRA uses biopsy to identify the precancerous lesions, which are then treated with chemical ablation, thermal ablation, or infrared coagulation. And so... Why CMAR and kind of where did we get to this work? I think it's really important to note that the Oregon AIDS Education Center has been working with CMAR Salmon Creek, which is in Clark County, Washington, for about uh, the last decade or so, um, really working along their path to become a Ryan White Part B and C funded clinic. And part of you might be wondering why Oregon? This is Washington State. Um, CMAR Salmon Creek is right across the river. It's in uh Southwest Washington, um, so right across the river from Portland, um, but it is part of the Ryan White Part A transitional grant area, so it is part of our catchment area for HRSA and HIV-related work that we are doing, and so that's why we started doing the work, and I think one of the things that's really important to note about Clark County is it is third out of all Washington counties for incidents of HIV infection, which is about 20 to 30 new cases a year, but it, and it's about fourth for prevalence. So it's one of the more populous counties with a growing number of HIV patients. And historically, prior to kind of our work with CMAR, has had some of the most disparate health outcomes related to HIV. And so a lot of the work that we've been doing um, with CMAR through my colleague, Raina Appenzeller, and through Tony Stupski, who's the medical director, has been really to kind of build a foundation for screening for treatment for integration of hepatitis C screening and, and cure, as well as thinking about how peers can be used to really support the patient experience. And so as of right now, JD, through a lot of efforts and working with Raina, um, has built up a rapid ART program and sees about 100 patients a year. Um, but I think it's really important to note that FQHCs are really uniquely positioned as the safety net clinics to provide services for those who probably have the highest need um, and may have other barriers to accessing healthcare. And so um, when we were thinking about this project, we were really thinking about kind of the role that CMAR can play in the community. They are the only FQHC in the region. Um, and it's important to note that even though Portland's right across the border, Medicaid patients in Washington can't go to Portland for care. So when it came to thinking about the work we were doing, it was really how do we make sure that Southwest Washington has the resources that they need to better serve patients. Um, so they were identified as a practice transformation site in 2016. This was part of our HRSA funding. Um, and so they met certain criteria. And what that really meant was that instead of just working on clinician education, we really were committed to doing work around the health systems transformation. And Practice transformation is defined by Centers for Medicaid and Medicare, or CMS, as a process that results in observable and measurable changes to practice behavior. And so we really work to set up um, coaching and practice facilitation um, to really assist our partner community health centers to enhance outcomes along the HIV care continuum. And so a lot of our work changes from year to year as far as what the priorities are, what the clinician priorities are, uh, but it really has been a longitudinal process um, working with CMAR to kind of build capacity. And HRA was a natural evolution as we have an increased um, number of patients on the patient panel that are HIV positive. Um, so in 2023, we kind of asked ourselves these questions based off of JD's interest. And really it was thinking about what would it take to build a provider's capacity to integrate HRA into HIV clinical practice? And what would that impact be on the overall health system? And so what we're going to talk to you about today is really that process of learning how we actually build this system. Um, and you're going to see some slides that have checklists and things like that. That really is from a toolkit that we're trying to create to really make sure that this is replicable information. 
Um, but these are the questions that kind of led our process um, in the work. And so we're going to start with provider capacity, and I'll turn it to JD to kind of talk about your experience. Um, yeah. So uh, I think uh, having a provider who is really motivated to do this is essential because um, it takes a lot of uh, work from that provider and uh, extra training. Um, uh, so uh, I, as I discussed earlier, I had a personal interest in addressing anal cancer among my patient panel. Um, I also think that um, being a family medicine doctor, um, uh, I think I have pretty broad training. Um, I did do a maternal child health fellowship, um, which included some cervical col colposcopy training. So I did have some um, kind of analogous training. I think cervical colposcopy and uh, high resolution anoscopy have a lot in common. Um, uh, and so uh, I think I was, uh, I had some background that was helpful. Um, uh, I also uh, got my HIV specialist certification um, so that I could offer uh, great care to my patients. Um, and then uh, I sought out um, shadowing and proctoring in HRA. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what so sites I went to. Um, but when I was reviewing the um, anchor study, it became really important to me to seek out some of the people who participated in the anchor study because I know that um, they standardized the kind of high resolution anoscopy they did in the anchor study to make sure it was all very high quality. Um, because HRA is a very operator dependent um, procedure, um, uh, I wanted to make sure that I was getting trained by the best um, and by the people who really showed that they could reduce um, anal cancer incidents. Um, okay, so the initial education. So step one for me was uh, taking the Ian's virtual uh, standard HRA course. So Ian stands for International anal, anal Neoplasia Society. If you look at the authors of the anchor study and look at like the board of Ian's, you'll see a lot of overlap. Um, a lot of the research around uh, anal cancer prevention and screening comes from this society. Um, uh, uh, and they released this standard HRA course, which is really high quality. It's all online, um, which obviously is a limitation, um, but also a benefit because anyone can do it. Um, but then it you know, the next step is it's really important to get proctoring opportunities and shadowing, um, which obviously requires more travel and time. Um, uh, and then I also attended the annual Ian's National Conference. There's a, a national anal, anal neoplasia uh, conference uh, every year, um, and I attended that last November, um, which is helpful for getting hands-on training as well as um, getting the most up-to-date research and care and see, being able to, you know, try out new instruments and devices uh, that are helpful. Um, so these are the preceptorships that I completed. So I, I was uh, able to uh, spend a day uh, shadowing Naomi J at the University of California at San Francisco, um, which I would describe as one of the the leaders in in anal cancer research. Um, uh, she's one of the principal investigators for the anchor study. Um, I was also able to shadow Hillary Dunlevy and Jeff Logan in Denver, um, and they were both uh, uh, authors on the um, anchor study as well. Um, and then uh, Michelle Babier is a provider in Portland. Um, who does HRA and does very high quality HRA. Um, and she's been probably my main mentor. Um, she's been doing HRA for a long time and I've been able to shadow her. Um, and because we're our sites are about 20 minutes away, I've been really fortunate to be able to have her come and proctor me at my practice. One issue, you know, once you're out of residency training and you're going to other sites to shadow, um, that doesn't mean that you're credentialed to, you know, practice doing the procedure or, uh, you know, trying to do the procedure at another site um, without you have you'd have to get like credentialed at other clinics and stuff. Um, so it was really helpful to have her proctor me while I was doing them at my own clinic um, so that she give, she could give me like real time feedback. Um, another uh, 
I think kind of creative way to uh, bridge the gap of of getting proctoring is uh, I've been able to record um, HRA exams with with my patient's permission um, and send them to Dr. Babae, who's uh, been able to give me feedback from watching recorded videos. Um, and I do know too, uh, Naomi J and others will um, will do like live Zoom proctoring where you know the the proctor and the practitioner are not necessarily in the same room, but uh, they're able to have them available by Zoom real time. Um, uh, so we kind of compiled a training checklist. Uh, it summarizes a lot of the things that we've already talked about, but I'll go through this list. I think the 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 online HRA course offered by Ian's is a is a must do. Um, I think attending at least two HRA pre preceptorships is important. I think seeing how different providers um, do the procedure is helpful so you can see, you know, what is essential that both of them are doing separately in different sites. And then you'll see differences in practice too. Um, and you can kind of take the best of both worlds for your own practice. Um, uh, and then I think if if you're able to establish a reverse preceptorship, have someone come proctor you during exams, that's uh, extremely important. You'd obviously want to have an experienced provider. Greater than five years experience would be great. Um, and then uh, I think, you know, depending on, on how easy that is to obtain, if you're not able to get reverse preceptorships super frequently, um, you can uh, do virtual proctoring as well, either in real time with the person watching or uh, sending recordings to someone for that they can review at, at their leisure. Um, also, uh, uh, recommendations from Ian's include tracking your data. Um, so there are certain quality metrics that we'll get to in a few slides um, that help you determine whether what you're doing is standard of care or not. Um, and so you should track your data and and try to, at first, you probably will not be meeting these measure, measures, but over time, you should achieve them. Um, and then also, uh, photo documentation is essential for HRA. Um, and so you want to keep those available for review um, and for uh, by both you and a mentor. So now that we kind of worked on talking about Jenna JD's process and really getting up to speed, I think part of the work that is mostly due in part to Raina Appenzeller as, as the practice transformation coach uh, for this project is really thinking about how do we build health system capacity to support JD in the clinic and patients getting access to the care. And so a lot of this is going to really focus on pre-implementation is what did we have to do to really set up ourselves for success? Um, and so this is kind of some of our experience of that process. And I think some of the key things that kind of came out of that was really making sure that the provider is ready to provide HRA, but then really thinking about unmet need for HRA in your jurisdiction and how do you measure that? Is your clinic ready and set up for um, billing, for example, of HRA? And then making sure that the cost benefit analysis makes sense for your system and then any technology considerations. So when it came to <clears throat> assessing the need for Clark County and for CMR Salmon Creek, we really were looking at first the epidemiology. What's going on with HIV in this area? Um, and so there's currently, or 2022 was the most recent data we had when these slides were due. Um, we had 868 cases of HIV living in Clark County, Washington. Um, that does not include the surrounding counties, even though Seymour Salmon Creek does see patients from surrounding counties. They're not just in Clark County because um, they kind of serve all of Southwest Washington. But the Clark County data is about 868 cases. There's about 20 to 30 new HIV cases diagnosed each year in Clark County, although I think in part due to JD's success having a rapid ART program, there's been increased screening. So we might see slight bumps in those numbers. Um, and really prior to expanding HRE capacity at Salmon, uh, Seymour Salmon Creek, any Washington Medicaid patients had only one option for accessing HRA. So if you were HIV positive and you were on Medicaid, you would have to go to Harborview Medical Center in Seattle, Washington. That's in the EHE jurisdiction, which is ending the HIV epidemic jurisdiction. Um, and it's about 158 miles or really a six hour bus ride away. And I think it's really important when we think about shared decision-making and being patient-centered in our work that we really sit and think about what does it take for someone to 
commit to a six hour trip um, to a city where they may not know anybody to get access to a, a preventative cancer screening um, and then to be able to take six hours back home. They might even have to stay the night. Where are they going to stay? Um, there are lots of challenges with that. And so it became a barrier. And so folks in um, more rural parts of the state were just not accessing HRA because of um, physical barriers of rurality. Um, and so I think the other thing to note is while some Washington patients with other health insurances were able to get HRA in Portland, mostly through uh, Multnomah County HIV Clinic um, or Kaiser, the Kaiser Health System does provide HRA and has for quite some time, you would have to have that health insurance. And so there was limitations there. But for Medicaid and, and general Medicaid, Medicare patients, um, the only access was up in Seattle. And so I think that's when we were thinking about the need for this service. It was really looking at what is going on in the community and how many patients does CMAR currently have or likely will have? Because even if they're not necessarily your patients, JD, I know other providers are not referring to you for care. And so in looking at this, um, we kind of, in assessing the need, I think the thing is really thinking about, do you have the patient population that needs to be screened that can also maintain that provider capacity? And so the recommendations are that a provider would complete at least 50 HRA exams per year to remain that level of competency um, for high quality care. Um, and it also can help adjust, uh, justify the initial costs of program setup. And we're gonna get into that a little bit later. So if you needed a checklist, for example, things that we looked at was epidemiology. Are there any other HRA providers in our area in Southwest Washington? There were none. Um, H JD is currently the only HRA provider in that region. Um, and then, uh, I think part of the thing, and I think we're going to talk about this a little bit, but when you don't have a place for HRA, it's a lot harder for folks to justify screening people with anal pap smears because you don't know where to refer somebody. So I think a lot of patients just weren't even being screened because there wasn't a clear referral network. And we're going to talk about that. Um, and I think there was also some effort to really use the electronic health record to see if you could identify how many eligible patients you have right now in your system to really justify the startup um, in the startup uh, investments. JD, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Um, uh, yeah, I would say that uh, I think um, in com we uh, a lot of the HIV providers in my area have a great relationship, and we meet periodically. And um, I found that a lot of providers are actually really eager to start doing um, anal cancer screening. Um, and the what they were waiting for was really someone providing high resolution anoscopy. And so I have seen that um, I know two of the other providers in the area have started doing anal cancer screening now, um, now that they have a referral source. Um, and I think uh, a lot of times people are, you know, they see these these studies and see the benefit of of doing anal cancer screening um, and they're eager to do it. Um, so. I think, I think having a good relationship with the other HIV providers in the area um, is really beneficial for, for uh, being able to start HRA in your community. Awesome. So just kind of um, as a review, um, I think this is still my slide, but as a, as a review of kind of the things that you might want to think about when you are trying to set up an HRA uh, program within your clinic is does your patient population reflect the prevalence and risk factors for anal dysplasia and cancer? Do you have a clinical champion that's willing to engage in the HRA certification process and this training process that's pretty intensive? Do you have institutional leadership to support this work? I know Dr. Tony Stupski, who uh, is the uh, the medical director for the CMAR Southwest Washington Clinics, you know, really was supportive of like, JD, if you want to do it, if you can make it happen, go for it, right? But you need to have that buy-in to be able to do that investment and take the time that it takes to really build up competency. <clears throat> the other thing is, do you have funding to pay for HRA-related medical equipment because it is not an insignificant financial cost to start up? Um, and do you have funding to pay for that ongoing and staff training and the time away from clinic it will take for that person to receive those proctoring um, and preceptorships? Do you have dedicated space? Space is always a big issue when we're thinking about clinics. And so making sure there's space because the col colposcope is quite large. There was a picture of JD in front of it earlier in the slide deck. So you need a space that is gonna be able to be available for exams. <laughs> and then have you talked to your lab to ensure that you have proper procedures for processing anal pap smears? 
And do you have your electronic medical record updated to include relative CP relevant CPT codes? Also making sure that you do have access to surgery or oncology consultation as needed. And if there is any ongoing funding to support those clinicians to really maintain their professional memberships um, and to really have access to larger image banks for that ongoing clinical support. So JV is going to go and dive a little bit deeper into what are we talking about when we say equipment and costs? Yeah, so um, uh, an important part of high-resolution anoscopy is the high-resolution part. So uh, the colposcope that you uh, use for high-resolution anoscopy is uh, of, of, of a higher quality than what people generally use for cervical colposcopy. Um, uh, so standard colposcopes are for high resolution anoscopy are somewhere around 10 to $15,000. They can be pretty expensive. Um, uh, the one provided in the example here is the one that I purchased or that our, I didn't purchase it, but our organization purchased. Um, and it's a, a Siler, uh, colposcope. Um, and it, includes a lot of the stuff that uh, you need. Um, there's Zeiss also produces very high quality colposcopes that can be used for this purpose among other companies. Um, but uh, our Siler scope uh, included some of the other things that we need. So uh, when you're doing the scope, you want to be able to record everything you're doing for quality assurance. Um, and so you want a beam splitter that show that sends what you're seeing to a, a laptop or a, a computer um, so that you can record it and then also uh, shows you the video of, of what you're seeing. So we also have a, um, a monitor that we use. Um, there's some other things like uh, small uh, uh, baby Tischler forceps, which are generally not used in cervical colposcopy either. Um, it's a specialized forceps that you use to do biopsies in the anus and use it use in other fields as well. Um, and then you you want to get the anoscopes, which are like the plastic um, uh, devices that you insert into the anus to visualize what you're trying to see. Um, and then there's a few other things. Um, uh, a hyfricator, that's the treatment that probably 90% of people who do HRA use to treat the high grade lesions. Um, that's something that's important to purchase. And that's a couple thousand dollars as well. Um, all in all, everything altogether, I think was about twenty five thousand uh, dollars in the way that we did it. I think that uh, um, you can go higher or lower than that. Um, uh, but it's somewhere in the ballpark of twenty five thousand dollars is what you may be expecting to spend as of, you know, twenty twenty two, I think, is when we did that purchasing. Um. So. The investment cost, like like you said, was about twenty five thousand dollars. And um, when doing the kind of math uh, in the background and kind of thinking about how we would pay for this if you were doing billing using uh, CPT codes, it would take in theory um, about seventeen weeks or four endoscopies scheduled in a half day clinic per week, which is about sixty eight exams, to recoup that twenty five thousand dollars in, in using the CPT codes for billing. So this is just a theoretical like math like what would you do what would it take but I think thinking about the CPT codes that are used for colposcopy um, and for HRA is really important and making sure that you have access to bill for these various things um, so that you can be bringing that money back into the clinic to set to offset those startup costs did you want to add yeah. anything JD yeah um uh yeah, the the uh one thing one kind of like a uh, roadblock that I ran into that I wasn't really anticipating is that um uh we our clinic uses Epic for our, our electronic health record um and uh CPT codes have to be like built into your Epic um so since no one had been doing high resolution anoscopy or uh really doing anoscopy at all um a lot of the CPT codes that you see on the right I had to uh, discuss with our Epic people to make sure that we could bring them into our Epic environment because I, I just couldn't, I couldn't place the order. I couldn't place the CPT code. Um, so you really do need like, uh, you, you need to uh, be th mindful of every step of the process um, for doing HRA and make sure that every step is, is coverable and uh, feasible to be done within your electronic health record and within your organization. And I think one of the other things that 
um, we kind of came up, came across, which is just the uniqueness of federally qualified health centers and their pay structure, which um, is very different than private practice or even hospital billing. And so a lot of FQHCs get reimbursed based off of their encounter rates, which is um, a set amount of money that's kind of established through your value-based payer for each patient is seen. This is how much you get per encounter. Um, and so realizing that an HRA encounter is not like a general primary care encounter, it takes a lot more time. Um, and there's a lot of uh, interventions that are, are done. And so I think it's important to really look at, and this is something that JD and I are, are really talking about, is how we can be approaching the value-based payer to negotiate a carve-out as HRA services should be excluded from the value-based pay encounter rate. And so there are services that are considered primary care services that are all fall within the encounter rate. There's a link in the slides to kind of the CMS um, services that would all qualify for the encounter rate. But really, when you add HRA, it really is having that conversation about getting a carve-out. HRA is not unique. There are carve-outs for lots of different things that don't fall within that kind of general encounter rate. But you do have to negotiate that in order to get the higher reimbursement for that patient encounter for an HRA exam versus not. And so if this is something and you are in a federally qualified health center, I think one thing this is kind of like the lesson learned between JD and I is really talking to your primary care association about how you can advocate to adjust that encounter rate and get those carve outs because HRA is a separate procedure um, and it's not part of necessarily the standard primary care. But until you do that, it will be well, kind of pooled into all of your encounter rate measures. And so I think it's important because when it looks at like JD's productivity, for example, it looks like he has less encounters, but the services are providing actually take more time. And so you want to make sure that you get that organized in advance. Um, and that's something that we kind of learned on the back end and are still kind of problem solving. I'm going to let you take over technology though, J JD, and talk about how you had to set some of that stuff up. Yeah, so um, uh, so I was kind of alluding earlier to how you really need buy-in from the everyone in the organization. There's a lot that goes into HRA. Um, so uh, you know, working with IT and your EHR people to get uh, CPT codes is important, and then also um, uh, you will probably need um, additional software uh, to in order to perform HRA. So when you're recording e exams, um, you know you need a, a video software to do that. When you're uh, taking snapshots and photos, you'll need some software for that. Um, and then a lot of people will annotate their their photos that they take to show the lesions that they're concerned about. Um, uh, so uh, some things that I looked into, Second Opinion is a really common um, software uh, that's uh, pretty comprehensive. It stores all of your exams um, so that you can keep them for years and years. Um, and it has standard annotation that you can use specifically for anoscopy, which is great. Um, uh, second Opinion is fairly expensive. Um, OBS Studio uh, is one that uh, was recommended to me by our, our IT people, partly because it's free, um, but it also does a really good job at recording video. And uh, I, I was able to uh, get snapshots really easily from it. Um, and then uh, Epic Pen is something we looked into. It's a free annotation software. Um, unfortunately, our IT people did not approve it. Um, I think there were some concerns about whether it would be like HIPAA compatible or something. Um, but uh, uh, I think getting some software so that you can annotate and include photo documentation into your notes and into your practice so that you can review prior photos from prior exams is really important. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, it would, these are all things that are important to do before patient procedures. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's everything. I think some of it is just knowing um, what your IT can work with and then how you're going to work with it so that you're ready in advance um, to be able to provide those services and get the documentation in the patient chart. So... <clears throat> That was kind of all of the work we did at the pre-implementation phase. And then it really came to implementation or how are we going to now get patients in, in, engaged in, in appointments and get the HRA exams? And then kind of how do we maintain our capacity and really integrate this into our systems of care? 
So part of this work and most of this, I'm going to give a lot of credit to Raina Appenzeller, who will be available for the question and answers of really thinking about how to develop those workflows and the kind of process mapping of how things actually work within the clinic system and really coming up with some standardized protocols for screening, linkage, and referral. Um, and then, of course, for, as part of implementation, having that ongoing virtual proctoring to make sure that we're getting that feedback in real time. So here's an example of one of the clinic workflows that I know JD, you and Reyna worked on. And I wonder if you want to talk people through this just so they can kind of get a sense of what this looks like at the clinic level um, for patients. Yeah, so uh, uh, so this is a workflow for showing what to do with abnormal um, anal cancer screening results. So anal cancer screening involves doing an anal pap smear, which is using a, a swab to collect cells from around the anus. It takes about a minute to do. Um, and it can be done at the end of like a regular primary care encounter. Um, and then also doing a digital anal rectal exam. Um, so after that's done, that can be done either at our own clinic or this could be done at an outside site and then referred to us. Um, we consider the results. If there is something concerning on the digital anal rectal exam or there is any abnormality in the um, uh, in the uh, cytology results, then at that time we would perform HRA. Um, and then uh, what we're really looking for is HCIL, which is another way of saying precancerous uh, lesions. Those need to be treated. So we would treat that. Um, so someone who gets treated for HCIL, we want to see them every six months for a year to two years. Um, and, then, uh, and then keep doing HRA every 12 months after that. Um, and then if someone does not have HCIL, they don't have precancerous lesions, but they have abnormal um, lesions um, uh, like, uh, 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 or sorry, if their cytology was high grade, um, then we would want to repeat that HRA because it's possible that we missed the high grade lesion on the HRA the first time. Um, but if the HRA confirms what we saw on cytology, that uh, they don't actually have precancerous lesions, then we can go back to doing anal cancer screening. Um, an important kind of uh, addition to this is that hot, hot off the presses on July 9th, the CDC and NIH released uh, guidelines recommending screening for anal, uh, anal cancer um, for uh, people living with HIV. Um, we don't have those included in the slides because unfortunately we completed the slides before these guidelines were released. Um, but a couple of things will are a little bit different in the guidelines. Um, so uh, another uh, uh, thing that was important to me and uh, important for this program is engaging all of the other providers who do HIV care in the area. Um, I mentioned earlier that we meet up semi-regularly. Um, uh, and uh, one thing that I did was create a uh, an anal pap smear handout, like a tool for uh, people to use so that they can um, know who to whom to screen, screen and then get a little uh, resource on how to perform these uh, anal pap smears. Um, there's helpful YouTube videos, um, as there are for everything these days, um, on how to do a swab. Um, I know some of the uh, authors of the anchor study have made their own vi videos on how to do anal pap smears properly. Um, and then uh, I, you know, included our own guidelines on what to do with abnormal results um, and whom to contact and how to get the patient in if there's an abnormal result. Um, and so I was able to distribute that to, to uh, relevant providers um, and uh, get more people than just my own clinic screened. Um, referrals to surgery and oncology. So uh, another thing we think about is what if you do an HRA and you find an anal cancer? Um, uh, that's not something that can be treated with HRA, with uh, hyfrication or any of the treat treatments that we use for precancer. That's something that usually needs to be treated by an oncologist with chemotherapy and radiation. Um, a select number of anal cancers can be treated by surgery. Um, and uh, uh, often, if there's something that you're suspicious might be anal cancer, but it's not showing up on the biopsy, um, you may want to get them to the surgeon for a, a, 
a more definitive biopsy. They may need an exam under anesthesia to do uh, a more appropriate uh, biopsy and workup. Um, so I think that it's important to build these referral networks um, to figure out whom you're going to refer to if you, you know, if you need to get a surgeon on hand, who you need to refer to for oncology. Um, uh, I will say that uh, so what I did was reached out to uh, people in my community and got, you know, kind of quick email responses that were like, yes, we are happy to see your patients. Um, uh, and while I think this uh, referral network is important, I don't necessarily think that you should uh, delay starting HRA for this referral, uh, getting this firmly in place, because um, there's a lot of benefit you can do for patients. Treating HRA is really beneficial, even if you don't have uh, a, a, an enthusiastic referral network in place. So I think the thing we wanted to kind of really also focus on is just sustainability. So you we did all this pilot to really figure out how do we start this up, but then also how do we sustain this over time? So this is an ongoing service for HIV patients in the, in the area. Um, and so one of the things that we really thought about was really what is the role of the primary care medical home for the integration of HRA? How do you support ongoing provider education? And, and what is the really mechanism for ongoing quality improvement to figure out how we can continually do better? And I think one of the things that's really important to think about when the primary care medical home is they are the safety net clinics. Um, they can't turn anyone away from care and are often um, really have a whole person approach to care where there's a lot of on-site additional services that might be needed to support a patient's success. So you might have on-site mental health or substance use treatment or other programs that really see folks um, where they're at um, and at this kind of primary care uh, home where they have a relationship. Because I think as JD has kind of mentioned or we'll talk about more is HRA, you do have a relationship with your patient. They are coming back. And so you wanna make sure that you're in a place that really works to build those relationships. Um, and so I think maybe you, JD, you could talk a little bit more about how patients aren't really jumping at the opportunity to have HRA and kind of your role as a provider in providing this service. Yeah, I was uh, I was just thinking about when you were uh, showing the distance that it takes by public transit to get to uh, Seattle from Vancouver. Um, I, I do, I'll, you know, many of my patients don't own cars uh, and traveling that far is, um, is just, you know, like not going to happen. Um, I was thinking about how I have uh, difficulty getting adherence from my patients when they live 20 minutes away from me, um, let alone, you know, what a barrier that would be if they had to travel to an outside clinic that's, you know, many hours away. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, it's for my patients, you know, anal cancer screening is very much like a novel concept. Um, and they're not excited about getting a swab in their anus, as you may imagine. And then uh, even people I've had who have been swabbed and need HRA, it can be difficult to convince them to come in for the anoscopy procedure because it's not, um, you know, it's more, even more uncomfortable than having a swab. Um, so uh, I think it's, it's, it's uh, you know, important to have that relationship with patients. I think hopefully my my relationship with my patients is encouraging more people to come come for HRA. And then it also helps with the follow-up that uh, patients who missed their anoscopy procedure, um, it's really easy for me to say that because I'm, you know, sitting there twiddling my thumbs instead of doing anoscopy. Um, and it's easy for me to follow up with them because they're my patient. Um, and so I see them for, you know, follow-up anyway. Um, so I think that helps the adherence. Um, uh, it's nice to have a medical home where you can get all of the, you know, uh, medical care that you need in the same place. So, um, oh, yeah. Uh, go for it. Okay, I will go for it. So uh, ongoing provider education. I do think that uh, HRA providers... I think it's uh, it's something you start to do, but it's important important to continue training, continue updating yourself, um, and continue reviewing your own data and making sure that yeah you are um, doing high quality HRA. Um, so uh, something that I do currently is uh, is uh, uh, submit virtual exams for review, get get feedback from my mentor. 
Um, I also am an Ian's member. Um, so I, they have like, uh, lectures that are free for Ian's members. And I, I, I attend those periodically. Um, I try to attend the Ian's scientific meeting, um, uh, to update myself, uh, the Ian's membership, you know, you can remove, re renew that an annually. It's, you know, like most annual medical memberships, uh, uh, a cert a price, um, and then, uh, and then, uh, what I, what I have done a little bit and intend to do more is, uh, compile and review, look back, um, at the last six months or a year periodically to review my own HRA data, um, and make sure that I'm hitting best practice measures. Um, so these are some of those quality metrics that I was mentioning. This is, uh, um, uh, a 2016 Ian's publication. These are guidelines that they publish for practice standards that are still considered the um, practice standards for HRA. Um, and you'll see a lot of a lot of things like you want to be able to fully see every part of the anus in over 90% of your exams. Um, uh, there's some other things that are kind of particular to people who have more understandable by people who have done HRA before. Um, some things are like uh, duration of the HRA. It should not last very long. It shouldn't last more than 15 minutes, but it should definitely last at least five, uh, five minutes. If they last too long, the patient gets a lot of discomfort and there's a lot of swelling that makes it hard for you to see what you need to see. Um, but if you go too quickly, if you if your HRA exam takes less than five minutes, then you're probably missing lesions um, and you're not doing a thorough enough job looking uh, through the anus. Um, and then patients really should tolerate the the procedure pretty well. Most people afterwards do not have problematic pain or bleeding, and that's something that you want to um, want to measure and and make sure that you're you know giving the patients the best experience that they can have. And JD, I remember you know you and I have talked in the past, but that you have also talked to patients about how the procedure's gone for them, but or played music for patients or done different things to help them be more comfortable. Um, do you have any like insights on how that's kind of increased the quality of the service that you're providing? Yeah, yeah. So I, th I think that um, a patient's experience is a is, is a big part of whether they'll come back. Um, as we were talking about earlier, often, um, often after doing an HRA and reviewing the results, the answer is to do more HRA. And so some patients are coming back for years to repeat HRAs. Um, and so uh, you want patients to have as good an experience as possible. And uh, something that I've learned through preceptorships um, with different people is that some people will play music um, uh, to help uh, patients enjoy the experience more. I have had one patient who requested that and, and uh, was able to listen to music during the procedure. Um, also, the screen that I have, I will offer to patients if they want to watch the procedure or not. Some people really don't. They want to, you know, get out, you know, get their mind out of there. And then some people really like being able to see what's happening, why why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, and I can explain what I'm seeing to the patient during the procedure. Um, uh, and then, uh, and then, yeah, I think because the biopsies are quite small, um, very routinely, every time I ask, I usually follow up with the patient the next week to both discuss pathology, but also um, see how they tolerated the procedure and then how they tolerated it afterward. Um, and uh, so far, everyone has not, no one has had problematic pain or bleeding after the procedure, um, which has been really great. So I think in in general, we just want to make sure that we're reassessing uh, the number of HRA, HRA exams that are required to sustain your program to try and get to that number of 50 per year. Um, and really collaborating with your community partners is an important part of quality improvement to make sure that folks know how to get folks into care and then identifying those process improvements that really do improve the patient experience. So one thing that we put together, this is not something we're going to necessarily go through in the slides today, but we wanted you to have it as a resource, was just a sample timeline. If we look back on the process that our team, um, Raina and you took um, through this process, we did make a timeline where we really kind of laid out like what did pre-implementation look like? What were the things that we set up and how did we really get this up and running within about a year um, after we decided that this was going to be our project? And so we have Im implementation here and then also just some of the things about sustainability, which are of course ongoing. 
but things for you to consider if you are considering uh, integration of HRA into your clinical practice. Um, and I think I just wanted to end on this really focusing on the impact that this has had on patients and what's next. So with that, JD, I'm going to turn you over to share some of your data. Yeah, so uh, so I compiled data at the end of the year last year. Last year was really when I started to do HRA. Um, and I uh, my first HRA was in April of last year. Um, and so uh, uh, it started with a difficulty getting everyone screened, but I had 23 patients who uh, underwent anal pap smear and screening. Um, uh, there were, uh, nine patients who had abnormal anal cancer screening results. Six of those operate opted for HRA. Um, uh, and then, uh, four out of six had lesions. Um, but only one of those had, uh, a high grade or precancerous lesion, which was H cell. Um, they were treated with hyfurcation. Um, we did do a repeat biopsy uh, months later, uh, which was negative. So that was exciting. And I actually just had another exam with him. This was his like six month follow up after that. Um, and he had a uh, normal HRA, which was exciting. And I think that's one thing that we talked about is like through this process, if we were able to prevent uh, the progression of anal cancer in at least one patient, it would be a success. Um, so when we think about the metrics that we kind of set forth when we embarked on this path, um, within the first six months, I think we saw a significant impact on patient life um, and quality of life. And so I think that's one of the things I just want to really shout out. And I know you've done uh, more you know, pap smears, but we hadn't run the data yet uh, by the time the slides were due. Um, but I just wonder if there's any kind of lessons learned now that you are kind of a year into this project? Yeah, yeah. So I would say, uh, yes, my my HRA numbers have increased a lot since last year. That's obviously like pretty low numbers considering the amount that we want to have, that we want to get up to 50 HRAs a year. Um, uh, I have a lot higher numbers now. Um, I will say I was, uh, uh, one of the lessons learned is I was surprised I, I was expecting in my mind when I was running the numbers, I was like, okay, well, everyone who needs an, a an anal cancer screening will get H anal cancer screening. And then everyone who has a positive result with anal cancer screening will get HRA. Um, but what I found is that, you know, it does, it takes a little <laughs> um, convincing or just ex explanation of the benefits. Not everyone wants to jump on anal cancer screening. Um, and then also it just takes time, I think, to kind of prove the program that you have it took a while to uh, convince uh, community um, physicians to go ahead and start doing anal cancer screening as well. Um, and so it can take a little time to uh, up and get running and, and get um, the number of referrals and get the number of screening exams that you really need to sustain the program. Um, but I think that's okay. I think, uh, I think everyone has to start somewhere and um, and you can, and the cool thing about HRA is that you really do monitor, um, how you do over time. And so you can keep improving over time and, uh, and get better and better at the procedure and provide more and more benefit to, uh, your patients. Um, so kind of what's next on the horizon. I think we've kind of talked about kind of increasing your practice, but I think, um, the other thing that we want to just bring attention to that HRA isn't necessarily just for HIV positive patients. Uh, these numbers are taken from uh, the anal, the uh, Ian's uh, screening guidelines, um, and they looked primary, primarily at a meta-analysis done by Clifford et al. Um, that looked at anal cancer screening in different populations. Um, and uh, uh, the, the people, the, the most important people to screen are the people with highest incidence. So, you know, you have the HIV positive um, uh, adults, um, who get screened either at 35 or 45 years or older. Um, and that's based on their high anal cancer incidence, but there's other groups like people who have other HPV related cancers or precancers like, uh, vulvar H cell, vulvar cancer, um, people with cervical H cell also have a higher risk or cervical or vaginal cancer. They have, um, higher risk of anal cancer. Um, also solid organ transplant recipients, um, because they are chronically immunosuppressed, um, HPV can be more active in them and can potentially cause anal cancer. So they have a higher risk as well. 
Um, but these are some other groups that that you may want to screen, as, uh, uh, especially if you have the capacity to do it, enough uh, time and enough HRA providers within your community to do to do this. And I think, you know, one of the things is it's more like we're starting with HIV, but I think as an FQHC, you see lots of different folks um, with lots of different health conditions. And so knowing that this is a service that could improve health outcomes for multiple patient populations down the road makes a lot of sense. But I think what I just really want to kind of bring back is um, by doing this project, we really have kind of addressed that you, the usual gap between best available evidence like the anchor study and practice change. Um, the research out there says it takes about 17 years. And I think what we've been able to do really is to see how can we get somebody scaled up within a year to really provide this service for patients so patients aren't delaying to get access to the uh, new standards of care. Um, so what we've included as we kind of close out is just a list of these resources that are cited throughout the, uh, the slide deck. Um, hopefully it will be a resource for you in the work that you are doing. I, I know that we are also happy to answer any questions that you might have um, either through email or uh, following this presentation if you happen to be in the in-person or in the live audience. Um, this is a slide from HRSA. So if you want CME for this activity, please make sure to go to this link to get your CME credits. And thank you so much for your time.